Welcome to season four of the Life Giver Podcast, a place for honest conversation and hope that will breathe life into your service, family, and home. This is your host, Corey Weathers, and I'm honored to take this opportunity to invest in you. Welcome to another episode of the Life Giver Podcast. This is Corey Weathers. Thanks for joining us again in season four. Um, I have Matt with me again. We are just lucking out with having you available. You haven't been available for a really long time. I'm just trying to score points with you, basically. I'm just (laughs) you did a good job. Really, just trying to add up, just in case I go into you know I need to you know take away from those points at some point. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Now we have like interesting discussions sometimes, and and then we kind of look at each other and say we should do a podcast on that and invite people into the conversation a little bit. Let's be clear: we have interesting discussions, and then you say we should do a podcast, and I go, "Oh, oh." Oh, no. Come on. You were the one that last time said when I had my nervous breakdown that you should do a podcast on that. Yeah, because I really like I really like getting you on tape whenever you're like frustrated or angry because it amuses me. Well, and then videos go viral like the TRICARE video. It happens. It happens. So welcome, everybody, to Inside Discussions with Matt and Corey. <laughs> inside Is that like Inside Edition? Inside Edition. Are we going to? The Weathers team. Yeah. Are we going to expose something today? Inside mm, Edition. No exposure of anything we should start over <laughs> nope we're gonna roll this is this is not b level footage this is a level footage a level footage well yep. um you know you're in school right now and school's about to ramp up so i don't mm-hmm. expect to have you available as much as you have been lately but i'm always thankful to invite you into the conversation a little bit and you know a lot of people like to hear from you because i think it shares um, the soldier perspectives the husband's perspective Um, And I think people just hear a little bit of their own marriages, you know, as we talk through things. And so we are going to talk a little bit today about the topic of family readiness. And um, it's really hard to describe or title what this conversation really is. But it's basically this idea of family readiness and how important it is, um, how crucial the family is to supporting the service member. You know, we hear from the military a lot, the DOD, that um, the family supporting the service member is a a huge component to mission effectiveness and um, being able for them to set their sights on the mission and be successful at that. And um, it's been a conversation that we've had this past week about um, what does that mean for family members to be supportive of their serving spouse? And I think this applies to first responders as well. But what does that actually mean and how do we have a conversation about that and how do we maybe communicate a little bit better about what family readiness actually is? And so it's going to be kind of just a conversation on that. Um, I did a Facebook Live on it and kind of started the conversation a little bit, but uh, I think that it'd be really good to hear your perspective on it as well. Okay. Well, who'd you start the conversation with? Who did I start the conversation with? Facebook. With Facebook. Facebook. The well. Facebook world. No, I think, um, you know, this is why this has come up. Because as I study the military culture, what I'm seeing and hearing from a lot of families is that we've been in some kind of global conflict, or if you want to call it war, <laughs> for yeah. going on 18 years now. And you and I talked over the weekend when we really thought that through. You're talking about... Families who have been in for a couple years and and families that have been in for 18 years, that's all we've known has been just intense tempos and deployments and trainings. We've never known peacetime. And that impacts families. It impacts marriages. It impacts your parenting. And so what I'm seeing from a lot of families is just a fatigue that's setting in. Mm -hmm. So when we have the military that says, you know, family readiness is important and support your soldier and make sure that, you know, you've got the whole, you know, you hold down the home front kind of thing. And that affects their mission mindedness. I think we're seeing some rising up internally in Mm -hmm. families about um, what it means when they're told, you know, get ready to support your soldier. Um, and so I think that's kind of what the conversation is about. Well, let me ask you, when you get told that, like if, if um, you know, we've moved around a lot and every time we go to a new unit, I mean, especially early on, the, there were a lot of briefings where a commander or someone would stand up there and really try and paint the picture of uh, what's needed from the family and, and what's coming down the pipe. I remember specifically there was a, a meeting where, you know, all the little tents were on the, the calendar after a deployment and everybody was looking at that calendar going, holy cow, are we, we're, we just turned and burned and we're going back to the field. And, and we've been at that op tempo 
for the entirety of our, our being in the military, mm -hmm. as well as other people have been at that op tempo since, I mean, if you think about it, in two years, people will be retiring who have spent their entire career at war. Mm -hmm. And that's significant. I mean, the USMA class, uh, the, the, the Air Force Academy, the, the West Point, the Naval Academy, the ones that graduated in 2001, um, they have been at war the entire time. Since 9-11. Since 9-11. Yeah. Since mm -hmm. 2001, they have spent their enti the entirety of their career at war mm -hmm. on that op tempo. And we've gotten used to it. But what goes... What comes up in you? What emotions do you feel when you get that that briefing of, okay, all right, here's what's needed from you. We need you to, essentially, we need you to give a little bit more. All right? You've been given. You got to keep giving because here's the next thing. You know, I think it's changed uh, the longer that we've been in. Mm -hmm. Initially, I think it was a feeling of excitement yeah. of being a part of something bigger than yourself. And, mm -hmm. and if, if it meant that I could support you to go do something that we both felt really passionate about mm -hmm. and had a calling to do as a couple, but you know, you going on on behalf of our family or whatever, mm -hmm. I think that that was exciting initially. And, it, and I think we were really creative with it, yeah. you know, really creative with care packages and, you know, so much going into so that support. But I think that now that we've been in for 12, 13 years now, mm -hmm. and that continues to be the message. Um, I think what comes up in me and what I noticed came up in other spouses was yes, that's what you're asking is not wrong. It's not bad. It's a good thing that you're asking. Yeah. But if I were to be completely honest, it is a, how much more can I give? Right. Um, it is how flexible do we need to continue to be? Mm -hmm. um, and if I were super honest, based off of what I'm also hearing from other spouses, is this resentment kind of follows yeah. after that. That is, um, hey, wait a minute. Um, we we have been flexible. We have been giving. You know, we have been responding to the needs of the military for a long time. Um, at what point does the family get taken care of? Right. That's a good question. And this honest conversation needs to happen. You know, in the military, we talk a lot about uh, leadership and two components of leadership really are your intelligence quotient and your emotional quotient. And one aspect of the emotional quotient is the first thing you have to do is you have to be able to identify the feeling that go that's going on inside you. You've got to get honest with it. You've got to get real with it in order to deal with it and figure out how am I going to um, express that? What's a good part of it and what's a bad part of it? So having the conversation is not only necessary, but it's good. And it leads to us having a higher emotional quotient in all of this so that we can become better parents, better spouses, better uh, supporting one another, better service members, better all around. Because if we don't have the conversation and get honest with the real feelings with one another, those things will leak out over time. Mm -hmm. And it'll leak out um, in places where it is safest to leak mm -hmm. out. And unfortunately, I think that is in the marriage mm -hmm. or with the kids. Mm -hmm. Because you can take it out on your spouse and your kids. Uh, I'm not saying you can or you should, but you, you feel like you can get away with taking it out on your spouse and your kids. And... Uh, not take it out on friends and, and not take yeah. it out on friends, not take it out on somebody in the unit. Um, but you got to get real and honest with it and allow that pain to be there because there's pain on both ends. Because from the service members perspective, we feel the pain of uh, that our calling, that our vocation um, for some people, it's just a job. But for most of us, it's a vo it's a vocation. It speaks to who we are. It's a calling. <laughs> Um, it's not just a service. It's almost a compulsion. It's like there's something in you that says, I couldn't do anything other than this. You feel pulled towards the job, but you also recognize that that the aspects of it that um, that are there, that are real, uh, that you see what it's doing to your family and it kind of tears you apart inside. So what I hear you saying on your end is there is resentment and there is frustration and there's tiredness. And on my end, there's all those feelings and emotions as well. Mm -hmm. And if couples aren't real and honest with it, they can't better support one another. 
They can't better see one another. And they kind of move into these, what I think, these little isolated enclaves in and of themselves. Uh, nobody's going to take care of me, so I'll just take care of myself. And they become this kind of little self-serving, egocentric little person before they actually kind of sit in the pocket of the, the, negative, the, the negativity, deal with it honestly before they can go, okay, now what? So if we, just get, if we just get honest with the negativity, that's one thing. But if you get sucked into it and you sit in the pocket of it, that's a whole other thing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's one thing to have a bad day, a bad week, but you can't have you know, a bad month, a bad year. You can't let this become poison in the well. Um, and I believe also, and last thing you can, you can kind of fill in, once we're honest with it, we can better develop community. Mm-hmm. Once we can take off the masks Um, We can actually deal with one another and go, this is hard. This is difficult. But the beauty is that the community, when it's working as it should, will remind you that you don't have to do it alone. Mm -hmm. And perhaps going through the difficulty in community is the most beautiful aspect of all of this. But if you don't, if you're not honest with the community about the negativity that's going on inside, then you can't go to your neighbor. You can't go to the the person next door, the officer, the NCO next door and sit down and close the door and go, this is hard. Mm -hmm. And I'm having to gut this out. And I think that is the sweet spot that at least I'll say for the service member, if you sit in the sweet spot of this is hard and difficult and it's taking everything, um, you make the connections that make serving just a jewel. You know, it's just, it's priceless. It's that camaraderie. It's the brotherhood and sisterhood. It's the family that you go, you know, we use the phrase, you know, embrace the suck. But when you embrace the suck together, then you can kind of laugh through it because you realize, I don't, I don't know of a life path out there that's actually easy. Yeah. This is just our life path. And it is asking a lot from us. And we have to, you know, resiliency, hunt the good stuff and remind ourselves that in the midst of the suck, there are some, um, to quote, uh, what is it? There's a, there's a band out there. It said, you won't believe the most beautiful things that come from terrible lies. And it reminds me, you won't believe, like you, you wouldn't believe the most beautiful things that can come from terrible times Mm -hmm. together. So I don't know. What do you? I, that was a lot to throw at you. No, no, uh, and I think it's it's a it's a good vision casting of where the conversation needs to go. I yeah. think in this episode, but also past this episode for families to right. consider. And I I think if we're gonna be, I'm gonna be like super honest, super like honest, super honest of what I think that is that like a 360 where it comes back around. Like it's Super. so honest, it goes around the globe <laughs> and it comes back to kind of dishonest. No, Ooh. no, All right. no, but I, I think, um, it's not necessarily something that I personally feel, but I, I feel like I feel it from other family members. Right. And, and it's like the one that it's like the feeling, the reaction mm-hmm. that you were asking me from in the beginning. It's the reaction that I think worries me the most about our families and how they're doing because, this is a complete guess. I don't know if this is exactly what maybe somebody listening is feeling this way, but there is, you know, we talk about in sacred spaces, the book that we, that I wrote that we have these emotional gaps of understanding Yeah, that there are things that you go through as a service member that I just can't understand. Oh. Um, and there's things that I go through that you just can't understand. Um, you, you watch me be creative with my career, right? Or you watch me, you know, try to figure it out, but you have a career that continues. You know, there's just certain things that we just can't fully understand in each other's world. And I think that the longer that we're in the military, the longer that families are in, the more um, separate they become. Yeah. And it does become just the job that that their service member goes and does the job and the spouse is either at home or managing home or trying to work or figure it out. Right. So here's the reaction that I'm afraid is out there that people aren't talking about Mm -hmm. and that they're having is that when the military says, um, we just need you to be flexible and we just need you to, um, cater to your spouse, cater to the mission, Mm -hmm. whatever. The reaction that I'm concerned about is that I think that spouses sometimes in their heart go, well, I have to do it without help. Like I have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Like, 
and nobody's revolving around me to, you know, I have to figure out managing the job and the education and the kids and the groceries and the whatever, you know, and I just have to manage. Yeah. I just have to figure it out whether or not there's room for me or not. Right. Mm -hmm. But then when the military over and over again is, is make a way, make a way for the service member to be able to do what they need to do mm -hmm. so that they can stay focused. I feel like I can feel the energy in the room yeah. that the spouses are going, but I do it without having a way to focus. Right. Like I have to multitask. <clears throat> and I, and if I really like dive into that a little bit and think about well, where would that come from? It comes from a misunderstanding. It comes from a, we get so used to the job being what it is yeah. that we don't understand and see the mission. We don't see what's happening in deployment. We've been told and we guess, and we know that for a lot of our, especially our infantrymen, the people that are on the front lines of things, especially that mission mindedness keeps people safe and keeps people alive. And that is absolutely crucial, yeah. right? Everybody wants their service member to come home safe. Mm -hmm. And so nobody says anything. Everybody kind of just quietens their spirit and pushes things down and goes, well, of course that trumps everything else. Yeah. Um, but not everybody is necessarily doing a frontline job. And especially if your spouse is not deployed, then I think um, I see a lot of families that lose sight of the mission. Does that make sense? It makes sense. And I mean, the first thing that comes up in me is I would say it's not the it's not the military's job and it should not be the job. It's I would I do not expect the military to be the one that casts vision for my family. Mm -hmm. I do not expect the military to be the one that has to tell my spouse and my children what it is that I do. Mm -hmm. And so in those meetings that, that happen often and they're good and they're well intended, mm -hmm. um, th that should possibly be a, a deeper or higher level strategic kind of thing. But it is my responsibility as a service member to put my, my role in national defense to put that in context for my family. Mm -hmm. And what I see often is that it uh, there's this divide and this separation. Now, obviously, there's, you know, depending on classification, certain things that people can't talk about, and that's totally understood. Mm -hmm. But even if it's just sitting down and talking about the news mm -hmm. and going, okay, here's what's going on globally. All right. And here's what I know. And I believe it's respectful and, and I think it's it's good uh, to have those conversations so that your family understands this is this is the the part that I play. This is the role that I play. John Maxwell, and uh, when he talks about levels of leadership and he talks about um, uh, it, empowering, encouraging and training up leaders, he talks about taking people up to like a thirty five thousand foot level. Uh, OK, here's the big picture. Here's the big, broad, you know, thing of what's happening. And here's the role that you play in it. And I know that one of the best roles that I play is, is to go around and to um, help soldiers understand the role they play. Mm -hmm. To be able to say, okay, so I've been over here and this is what's going on over there. Now here's how you plug into that. Here's how you plug into the grand scheme of things. So I've seen soldiers lose, lose heart and lose hope and lose encouragement simply because they are unaware of what's going on around them. Uh, constantly putting in front of the family, we are part of something so much bigger than ourselves. Now, I'm not saying that everybody should constantly defer and go, well, I'm just going to feel happy or I'm just going to not feel these negative emotions or attempt to honestly deal with them because, um, you know, I'm, I'm part of the bigger mission. So I just kind of have to, you know, after, after a while, people need to validate and normalize the negative feelings that they have and deal because you've got to do that before you can actually deal with them and figure out how you're going to address it so it doesn't flesh itself out in your life in a dysfunctional manner. Um, but I, I fully expect service members to have those conversations to go, OK, here's why this is important. Not just here's what I did at work today. Here's the personalities I dealt with. And this is why my boss or this is why my soldiers are getting on my nerves and coming home and griping, complaining. And that and that actually is a whole nother issue of if I'm constantly coming home and complaining about my work, mm -hmm. my spouse and my family are going to hate it that much more mm -hmm. if it's asking so much of me. So I really need to to deal with my own stuff and figure out. Why am I, you know, if that is is happening, why am I constantly coming home and being negative about things? How do I need to reframe it 
you know, not to come back and be like Pollyanna and overly positive, but to come back and go, okay, so this is honestly what's happening. But if I see it from that service member's perspective, okay, I can, I can deal with that. And, um, and I can, uh, not, you know, allow that to take over in my life. Does that make sense? Yeah. I actually had not thought about that. Cause I mean, if, if a service member is coming home and they're being negative, it's, I mean, immensely more difficult yeah. for that spouse to cater, you know, or revolve around that schedule yeah. for something that everybody's not even happy with. Right. And I'd like to go back to what you said in the beginning where you talked about um, this can become a poison. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. It, and it can be something, the negativity on both sides, mm-hmm. for sure, can become, it's almost like a cancer and um, one of the reasons why I decided to do the Sacred Spaces book again and do it as a book club was because I I know that I started to get I started to experience some more resentment yeah. creeping up in my own heart um, just out of that weariness and realizing ooh I need to I mean I wrote the book mm-hmm. <laughs> you know and I like when I wrote the book like I did a good kind of like a cleansing of that you know it was a it was an amazing time for me to uh, in Afghanistan like leave that resentment of the first 10 years of, of how it had changed our family, changed you, changed our yeah. marriage. And to leave that in Afghanistan was a huge mile marker for me. Yeah. And then we had, you know, a few more years of struggle and suffering of mm-hmm. just inconvenience, yeah. you know, nothing huge that um, I can actually complain about, but just really just inconvenience. Mm-hmm. Um, and just that fatigue setting in of moving more often. And I started to notice my own negativity and my own frustration and, and getting to that place that I've also seen other families get to where it's just, hey, you know, I mean, I, I know that the military, you know, has great family programming and, and has great intentions and really does care about their families. But I'm starting to question that just a little bit with my own sanity, you yeah. know. And realizing that some of that resentment was starting to creep up myself. And that's why I was like, I, I got to take a look at this again because I don't want it to grow like a cancer. Right. Um, and we covered, you know, even in that last <clears throat> episode or so when we talked about the PCS. And that was a little bit part of my little breakdown there because it was I was just tired. Yeah. I was just tired. Yeah. Um, and I even heard another service member say this morning that his wife had gotten to a place where she was just like, I'm not moving anymore. Yeah. I'm just not. Mm-hmm. And that makes me so sad. Yeah. I understand it. I get it. There's so many families listening that you maybe have tried geobatching or you're considering it. And it's making me sad that people are getting to a place where they're going, I just can't do whatever, fill in the blank anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's really asking the question, how do we do this difficult lifestyle and, and cast vision. I feel like something in me changed and turned a corner this past, I think weekend, even, okay. um, something shifted in me and I, I came to you once and I'll probably come back to you several more times, but I, I came to you and I just said, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Like I, my heart has really not been in a good place lately. Mm-hmm. And I've, and you've never pointed it out to me. You never, um, challenged me on it. You never asked me to change. You've been extremely patient with me as I've been kind of just complaining and frustrated. Um, and a lot of times you even echoed some of that frustration and joined me in it a little bit but, yeah. and sat in that pocket with me. Um, and I want to thank you for being patient with me throughout that process. I don't think you can force anybody to go through a process quickly. Otherwise it becomes coming out on the other side is really artificial. That's true. All you can do is walk with them through it. And allow them to process it. They've got, everybody has to own their own. You're, you're totally loving that I'm finally saying this after 20 <laughs> years of marriage. Everybody has to own their own feelings. Nobody can, what is it? Uh, nobody can manage one another's feelings. You can't yeah. do that. Um, you got to validate what what that person's experiencing. And, uh, you know, I'm reminded of the quote from Tombstone when Wyatt Earp at the end of the movie, he's talking to... Um, Uh, that woman, I forgot her name, but, um, she goes, what do you want, Wyatt? And she's just kind of exasperated. And he goes, I I just want to have a normal life because he's never been allowed to have a normal life simply because of his talent and his Mm -hmm. gift and his ability and really kind of the calling on his life. And he says, I just want to have a normal life. She goes, there's no normal, Wyatt. There's just life. Mm -hmm. And I think we all, I don't know when we get to that point. 
mm-hmm. where we stop looking around and go, that must be what a normal life looks like. Mm-hmm. You drive past a home where it looks like they there's a swing that looks like it's been in that tree for 30 years. And you're like, there it is, right? That's what I've wanted my entire life. But nobody knows what life looks like on the inside of that house. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows what they're going through. Nobody knows maybe the incredible lack of adventure or the mm-hmm. severe boredom mm-hmm. or feeling locked into a group of friends that aren't maybe aren't the best, aren't really encouraging and aren't really moving forward. And after 40 years, you're like, OK, I really grew roots in the wrong soil. Mm-hmm. What did I do with my life? Mm-hmm. Now, we don't have that. We have to constantly reevaluate every 18 to 24 months <laughs> if you get that. Uh, but that that can be kind of a joy where you go, OK, you know, you've said before, when I move to this next location, you know, completely reinvent myself. One of the things that is a gift uh, that we don't look at is the ability to reinvent oneself. Mm-hmm. The mistakes that I made at the last place, I don't have to make at this one. Oh, and by the way, I don't have to work so hard at this place to try and overcome those mistakes because I'm a a different person Mm -hmm. to them. And I can go in there with a whole new slate. And in a, in a real way, we can advance and evolve and move forward faster in 20 years Mm -hmm. than many people can in an entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. And uh, we may not have to live with those, some mistakes we have to live with, but the other little tiny ones, you don't have to. So it really is, You know, when we think about this critically, it's about how do we reframe the problem? Because the problem is there. Mm -hmm. The problem is I constantly have to readjust everything in my family every two to three years, three year. Man, if you get three years, woo! I mean, some of you guys out there have been in one place for like seven, eight. First responders may not have moved in a long time. But here's the thing. But that's a whole other level of struggle. I've also known people that have been locked into the same unit for three deployments. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that, they're like, they feel stuck. They feel stagnant. Maybe they feel their career is stagnant or they can't be viewed as anything other than who they were as a junior soldier or junior NCO or junior officer, whatever. And uh, after a while, that gets old. And they, it is that grass is greener on the other side of the fence thing. And so what we want to acknowledge is, okay, I own this grass. This is, this is what's given to me in life or this is what we've chosen. Okay, what am I going to do about it? How am I going to reframe this? How am I going to get something good out of this? You know, I think one of the things that changed in me, I don't, I, well, first of all, I'm the op, one of the optimists in the family, so I can't stay down for very long. <clears throat> right. I mean, like one of two, I, one of two, <laughs> yeah. um, we're half and half in this house. Right. Um, Jack and I will bring you back down to reality. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that was part of my turning yeah. Like turning a corner was that I, I couldn't stay negative for very long before I was like, enough is enough. Right. Like I just can't live here. I can't camp out in this negativity. Um, and I know not everybody out there is that way. Um, so I think that was part of it for me. Um, but I think I got to a place where I was, I was done being a victim. Yeah. Um, it wasn't working. No. Um, and, and nobody is coming to the rescue. Um, in this lifestyle. No, because everybody you know? else is going through the exactly. same thing too. So really it comes down to, wait a minute. I could either sit here and flounder around and mm-hmm. flap my my arms against the surface of this water and ask for somebody to come rescue me. Mm-hmm. Or I can acknowledge that I can become a good swimmer, get in a lifeboat, and then go try and rescue other people. Right. And I think that's what happened in like, like in a series of like events, Mm -hmm. you know, it was a first like, okay, I can't be negative anymore. I'm, I'm not happy. And I'm the only one that has control over that. That was step one. Step two was, okay, I can't be a victim Mm -hmm. because I'm looking around and I'm feeling the victimization that Mm -hmm. is all around me. It's not just me, but I was actually sitting in an auditorium and feeling the energy of the room, just go to this victim place. Um, And knowing also from the surveys that I've done that, you know, there are a lot of military spouses, Mm -hmm. especially that are feeling that way. And so I just had to ask myself, what, what now? Like if we feel victimized, 
what now? What's next? Because I'm not going to just sit around and then come back to the next meeting only to feel victimized again. Right. Um, you know, I think going back to leaders asking families to be mindful of their service member, be mindful of the mission. And, you know, specifically where we are right now with school and the intensity of school, it was being asked to be fluid. And, and I think the, the, com- the common reaction with the spouses were how much more fluid can we be? Yeah. <laughs> that was kind of the first reaction. It was, it had to go then to a place of grace right? where I then had to go, you know, what they're asking is not, is, is a good thing. What Mm -hmm. they're asking is understandable. Yeah. You know, nobody's doing anything wrong here. Nobody's asking for anything that's unfair. Mm -hmm. So it then comes down to, I'm not a victim. I need to extend you grace, not just you, Matt, but like extend the leader's grace that they are doing the best that they can to make sure that you succeed, make sure that those units succeed, that platoon succeeds or whoever else needs the mission succeeds. And it's their job to think about what makes the mission succeed and ask for it or make a way for it. And so I need to be able to extend grace that if, if part of making things succeed, the mission succeed, um, comes down to my support, then it's not wrong for them to ask that. And I need to extend grace when they don't ask for it perfectly. Yeah. And I mean, a huge thing that I just occurred to me is this sounds bad. But I don't want to say this sounds bad. like these are first world problems. Mm-hmm. What we're really honestly dealing with are like upper echelon top tier first world problems. Right. You know, I'm, I, I got to think in my mind, what about if from my perspective, how many millions of dads around the world would would I mean, are literally probably just kind of killing themselves to provide for their family? Mm-hmm. How many are like any chance, any opportunity, two, three jobs just to provide food, an opportunity mm-hmm. to to get a good education, even in just a school, maybe not even a college? Mm-hmm. I mean, to be able to, to clothe kids, because that's really the goal of every parent is I want my children to have it better than I did. Mm-hmm. Good parents. Those are the, the good parents. And um, a way to reframe this is um, it's not a matter of asking the spouse, I need you to serve your service member so that they're better. Possibly reframing this is here's the role each one of you are going to play in order to take care of your family. Mm-hmm. Can you expand on that just a little bit? Well, I mean, it's this idea of um, if we just simply say our goal here is to take care like our children, like let's just say our children. Mm -hmm. If our goal is to take care of our children and and their future, then whatever we have to do and however we have to support one another. And that's what I want to kind of move towards of how we support one another. The end result is the same. We together are taking care of our kids. Now, whoever carries the load in that moment and whatever the load is, you know, you do it to the utmost of your ability with as much passion and desire in your heart. Mm -hmm. And it's not telling anybody you're on a back burner. It's saying like, let's just say the the business of the house has to get done. Mm -hmm. And all the different things of that just have to get done. And however you divide that labor up, then great. Y'all figure it out amongst yourselves, Mm -hmm. but the business of the house has to get done. Why? Because that's your house Mm -hmm. and put it in order Mm -hmm. and don't, um, don't complain. Don't look at my job and go be envious because as much, as much as you have said, every time we move, I've got to reinvent myself. Well, guess what? Every service member out there starts at zero every year, Mm -hmm. every year. Because once the evaluation is in the books, the the only thing on the service member's mind is, how do I make the next evaluation great too? Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, new job, new responsibilities, new New group, new people, new group of friends, because we're going to assign you friends. Oh, and guess what? We may make you go live with them for a year, nine Mm -hmm. months to a year, and you don't get a choice. We're going to give you a roomie. Hope you like it. (laughs) We're going to tell you what to wear and, and what to eat. And in all honesty, those are very comforting things Mm -hmm. because you don't have to make those decisions for yourself. But there's so much freedom that's that that is given up in service to your family, in service to the community, in service to others, Mm -hmm. trying to to fight and win wars so that your kids don't have to go fight and win wars. 
I mean, these are these are huge things. And really, the problem is, is that we get into our, our woe is me, our doldrums, mm -hmm. and that's good to get there so that you can reframe the problem and go, okay, what's the real problem mm -hmm. that we're dealing with? What's the real issue? Well, first of all, I want to say... Is that a little um, too passionate? No, it's it's important. And um, and I'm not editing any of it out because it's convicting. It's convicting for Edit me. Edit the coughs because I was coughing <laughs> earlier. It's convicting for me. <clears throat> and it's right. I mean, a lot of these are first world problems. Yeah. And um, I think we lose sight of that. Any of us can lose sight of that. And I think that for me, I had to cast new vision for myself yeah. and ask myself, what do... What if, if this is our lifestyle mm -hmm. and if I don't want to be a victim, then I've got to decide what am I going to do instead? Yeah, How look. do I shift the trajectory here and get excited about this again? I think that's what shifted in me over the weekend is I needed. And part of this, I think, was the PCS and the energy and getting the kids settled and everything. I took a lot of energy. And so I had to find my energy again. Yeah. And it's PCS season. Yeah. And so I think there's a lot of people that we have to give grace during certain seasons, during certain changes. Um, and I think that was part of my turning that corner. Yeah. Um, but you're right. It is it is first world problems. And there is suffering no matter where we go and no mm -hmm. matter what lifestyle we have. I, I was thinking it'd be nice if we had these little energy meters that were sitting out on the front lawn where people could just go, oh, that person is high on energy and I'm low. So I'm going to go visit them and get a little bit of a little bit of energy. <laughs> you know, you've got to be graceful with yourself when you don't have energy. If you try and fake it, you'll become resentful. You'll become more resentful faster. And it, that resentment will actually fester. You've got to leave the wound open so that it heals from the inside out. And so to clarify, because if people have been listening to me on Facebook or listening in a previous episode, I want to clarify that I have said a couple <clears throat> times that when it's when we are stepping out in confidence to take a risk and try something new, even if we don't feel like we have the full confidence to do it, you can fake it till you make it. And that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is more so you can take steps forward, but you still have to be authentic and transparent and deal with what's actually going on. Yeah. I said earlier today in a Facebook live that if we don't pay attention to what we're feeling about something and deal with it and just put a mask on and just ignore it. Yeah. We will be a shell of a person. Oh, it's a, down yeah. Road. So, um, in introducing that concept, the, which is very vulnerable. So it's, it's a place of vulnerability is, um, we're comfortable with it because we can live in it and we know that it's, it's a place of creativity. It's a birthplace of connection, that authenticity that really gets us to community much faster and uh, that selfless community that that really is like a hallmark of this community. You can't you can't do this life inauthentically. Mm -hmm. What you can't do it well. That doesn't mean that if you're constantly negative, then you should authentically go be negative. You should authentically find out why you're negative all the time. It has more to do with wrong expectations and unmet expectations unmet wrong expectations mm -hmm. than it does with really anything really you're you're just kind of displacing blame onto something else and mm -hmm. you know um so we i mean i uh, hear that and hear we really need to consistently do a check on what our expectations are yeah, oh, and whether absolutely. or not the military can meet those expectations, whether yeah. or not our family members can meet that expectation, yeah. whether our friends can meet those expectations. Yeah. And I, I think I also, I also want to point out here that I had to realize that my negativity, um, ultimately impacted you. Yeah. And that was something that I had to take a really, um, big look at. And so when you talk about things being first, you know, this negativity being a first world problem. Um, and when you, when you talk about even the service members perspective that, um, you know, I even, uh, you say this to me all the time, not in correcting me necessarily, but just educating me and helping me see your world and helping me see the inside world of a lot of our men specifically and what it's like <clears throat> to have this kind of job and carry this kind of weight, mm -hmm. um, which we need to hear a lot more of. Um, I even heard it from a leader this morning, actually sharing the burden yeah. it is to ask family members to uproot every single time they get promoted or go to the next job or the next assignment and the burden that places 
on you guys as service members. Mm-hmm. Um, and so many of these, so many service members don't talk about that. You just share with it. But I just want to say, I had to realize that in my negativity, I was impacting not only your view of your job, your view of your calling, yeah. your happiness in your calling, um, and making that burden worse. And it was a burden that you couldn't fix. It's not like you could snap your fingers and everything would be made better. Like you're in a job yeah. that you are not leaving anytime soon, nor would I want you to. Yeah. And yet if I'm being negative and not taking care of myself, mm-hmm. then now you are trapped in a job that is providing for our family and, and providing in ways that we should feel blessed on. But now I'm making that burden even heavier. Yeah. And it's not solving either one of our issues. You know, I just thought about this, this, this concept of uprooting. I do want to constantly reframe these things. If we have, if we view ourselves as an isolated tree, then every time we get uprooted, then yeah, just like, so for those of you that don't know, my wife does gardening and um, on any given week, she is constantly uprooting plants and moving to other pots. So they're in ideal places. And, uh, and so I watch her uproot things often in order for them to be in better places. Um, sometimes you have to be uprooted to be in a better place. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you're rooted in a bad place mm-hmm. and you're rooted in a, a bad negative community. I mean, we've watched, I mean, even with our moves, all the, this move was worth it simply because of having all those teenage boys over downstairs mm-hmm. basement. That was everything. Mm-hmm. And we haven't had that. Anywhere. anywhere and so this move which we did not know we were we we put ourselves out there and we were hoping and we have done that a bunch but this time the roots actually took yeah and um what if instead of viewing ourselves as like this individual tree that gets uprooted and transplanted to another place what if we realize that we're not being uprooted from like isolation i mean in the military community we have roots that extend to other trees. Mm-hmm. What if instead of viewing ourselves like that little Bradford pear out in the front yard, we view ourselves as the redwoods in California that cannot grow as tall and as thick and as sturdy and as timeless as they can without being consistently rooted to one another? What if we're giving the what if we are being given the opportunity to grow roots into other trees? So that we have that support. We have that level of, we create that community. We become the difference that we want to see in the world. The world is full of people that want stuff given to them. Mm -hmm. Nothing is given to you. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of the movie Unforgiven with Clint Eastwood. I love Westerns because I think that. So Clint Eastwood, (laughs) Gene Hackman, at the very end of the movie, I'll spoil it for you. Gene Hackman is laying on the ground and Clint Eastwood has come to exact revenge on this a wayward lawman who is Gene Hackman. Gene Hackman looks up at him and he goes, what, why are you doing this? I don't deserve this. And Clint Eastwood looks at him and only the way Clint Eastwood can say it. And he goes, deserves got nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. And it's this idea. And, you know, we make fun of younger generations for a sense of entitlement, but when it comes down to it, we're really just acknowledging what, what really is in each one of us. Mm -hmm. And I'll, you know, for a second, I want to go into, um, a biblical story. Can I do that? Absolutely. So there's a guy who's a warrior King and his name's David. And I'm going to tell you about two instances in David's life. The first one, he's on the run and he is actually hanging out in a cave and he is surrounded by his mighty men. And they go into this huge description about mighty men. But I mean, you were talking about the baddest of the baddest of the baddest. I mean, people that are killing like tens, thousands of people just with their bare hands. I mean, just, you know, just the baddest, best people ever, like Mm -hmm. the toughest warriors. And David, Just off the hand says, you know what, if I could just get a drink of water from home, because he's on the run. He is deployed in a strange world, in a strange place. And David said, if I could just get a drink of water from home and his mighty men who love him so much, they actually sneak out of the cave. They sneak through enemy lines, sneak into the the um, uh, his uh, uh, his palace into his separate sacred little well in there, get him a cup of water and then sneak that cup of water all the way home. And you think about everything they had to do in order to get that out of their love for him. Mm-hmm. They get there and he sees their love for him. 
And in response, he actually pours the water out on the ground. And he said, far be it from me to drink this water. It would be as if I was drinking the blood of my own men. To, to say this, I, this if, I, if I allow myself to enjoy this, quote, entitlement, they think I'm entitled to, it would be as if I would been of, have been okay for them to die while they were on this mission. And, and they are more important to me than the water. And that's, he can say that because he's in a bad place. And when you're in a bad place and you're in the suck, it's easy to deny yourself stuff. Mm-hmm. But when you allow yourself to get surrounded by comfort, you know, comfort and the ease and those kind of things, you start to feel like, okay, this is comfortable. All right, I feel entitled to this. Okay, maybe I'll improve this a little bit here and improve that. Maybe I'll, maybe I need more better things around. Maybe this is what I deserve. Because later on in David's life, it says he was sitting at home at the time when kings go out to war, which is an indication of that's where David should have been. David should have left home. David should not have been sitting in a palace with the silk and the fine feasting and all everything. And it was at that moment where David looked down and saw the wife of one of those mighty men mm. who was out at war. Mm-hmm. And when he saw that wife of one of his best friends who was out at war, it was he he took her because he felt entitled because he was in comfort. Mm-hmm. And comfort is that place that if we sit in too long, we'll forget we're not entitled to it. We don't deserve it. We did nothing to earn it. So I think how much should how much more should we be sitting in the cave and enjoying the company of the people around us going, yeah, this is hard. This is difficult. I mean, you talk about this um, family that had uh, their son um, here on post who was going to have a birthday party. Oh, my gosh. Was yes. going to have a birthday party. Four, and a four-year-old who was going to... they had just, Now, where we are right now, a thousand families move in the same month. Yeah. And so you talk about, like, everybody starting at ground zero. Yeah. Nobody knows anybody. And this um, one spouse had posted that her son was about to turn four, mm-hmm. and he was looking forward to his birthday party. And, of course, they had not met anybody yet. Yeah. And she put out on Facebook, I yeah. don't know if anybody wants to come to a four-year-old's birthday party, <clears throat> but we're going to be outside in our front yard on Sunday at this, you know, these times, if anybody wants to, ha- if anybody has kids and wants to come to a little four-year-old's birthday party. And then a um, hundred people showed up. A hundred people showed up. Now, how much that never would have happened had they not been here? That never would have happened had they not uprooted. And how much did that rewrite that kid's narrative? More than that, even if he never remembers that. Oh, he'll remember. I'm it. thinking about that family. Yeah. I mean, to me, that is church. Yeah. That is what that is what love is about. That is what community is about. Yeah. And and you know what? That was. I think, I don't know if that was yesterday or this morning that I read that, but Mm -hmm. that was also part of my transition. I think it was another part of my turning the corner to go, you know, things aren't that bad. Yeah, they're not. You know, things have not been that bad. It's just been a rough season and I've been tired and and I need to remember that the next time things change. I need to remember that the next time things get difficult Mm -hmm. and I have that entitlement that comes up. Um, and that if it is something that I actually need help with, I need to ask for it. I need to learn how to ask for it in the right way yeah. and not store that up in my heart yeah. um, or allow it to leak out through negativity. You can't sit inside in resentment, expecting people to know what's going on inside right. you. Nobody can read minds. Right. And so I think that that story of realizing there is no other place I would rather be yeah. than part of this community. Mm-hmm. I think... The perspective that you have walking into every day, you can't make every day great. It's just not going to happen. There are going to be bad days out there that you're just going to have to gut out. But this pers- the perspective that you walk into every into each day with will often dictate what you see in that day. In the sense of if you if any of us, not you, I'm not saying you pointing at you, but if any of us just walk into a day going, this is just going to be crap and I'm just tired of dealing with this and I'm just going to get through it. Guess what? You're not going to see anything good. And you're probably going to be carrying such a negative vibe about you that that's what you're going to get back. But if you look at look out at the world and go, how can I make this about another person? How can I help up out another person? How can I make it count? Going back to one of our key phrases, how do I make this count and make it meaningful? You'll find a way to make it meaningful that you'll just hook on 
onto that day with that little bit of Velcro and go, there. see, that's what it meant today. Today, I can cling to that. And it may just be that you greet a cashier at the commissary on payday well. Mm -hmm. It may be that there's a little kid that has a better day simply because of your attitude. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what that's going to produce. All you can do, it's like a good gardener. All you can do is try and give it the right food, the right water, the right sunlight, the right soil, the right everything for it to grow. But that plant has to grow how it's going to grow. You just have to create the conditions for it to grow well. And I tend to think that if we make it about other people, for them to be doing well, then we will receive back that joy of the impact and the influence that we have. We're talking about first world problems. And I'm not saying this to make people feel bad. Believe me, Corey and I have kicked rocks down the road with a <laughs> woe is me attitude. I should I should have a little mirror up in front of this microphone as I'm saying this so I can remind myself because tomorrow I will need this reminder because I'm a frail, fragile, faulty human being that forgets very easily. I think that's going to land with everybody in different ways. Right. For For some listening... It is the spouse, you know, and I think we have to find as spouses the right balance. Yeah. We have to, um, we need to take better care of ourselves. Yeah. We need to take control of the things that we can take control of, which is really only ourself. Um, we need to balance that with community yeah. that we don't need to become an island. We need to go out there and like you said, make that community and, and making sure that we're investing mm -hmm. outside of our homes. Um, I think for others listening, it could be maybe you're parenting a child right now that's been in a place of a title entitlement. Yeah. And um, and and that's who we need to focus on yeah. and, and introduce some of these concepts to a child. Maybe it's the service member. Yeah. There's a lot of service members out there that um, get into the military with certain expectations mm -hmm. and it's not going the way that they want it to go. Yeah. And a lot of this lifestyle teaches you and forces you yeah. to learn that things are not going to always go your way. No. Most of the time you don't have a vote. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we release that quickly <clears throat> and sometimes we want to fight that a lot. And it's okay to want to fight it. It's okay for that to come up. I'm not trying to say that people got to, you know, push aside negativity and be Pollyanna. I believe me, I'm the pessimist in the family, huge <laughs> pessimist. I'm the first one to go, well, that's a bunch of crap. I'm not going to deal with that. That's, you know, bad. That's bad planning on man's part. But if I allow bad planning on man's part to dictate my life, then why don't I just let everybody else just, you know, be in charge of my feelings and my emotions? Why don't I just give up my misery and let somebody else flip the switch on my misery? And I hate feeling out of control enough as it is. But if I have the opportunity, like um, Viktor Frankl said, you know, you don't have control over what of what happens to you. The only thing you have control over is your reaction. Mm -hmm. And this was from a man who like lived in a concentration camp. And when I put that in perspective, you know, I talk, we talk about moving. An honest question, and this is a tough question, is how many how many gold star spouses do you think would go i would move one more time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i would move two more i would move three i'd move every month if i could just move if i could just move back in with them mm -hmm. i think to bring this back full circle on family readiness what do you feel like the military is actually trying to say i mean you're as i guess you're as ready as you can be but kind of implied there is that you're going to be ready for whatever the next thing is in two decades of war have proven we're reinventing being ready at, er, at every point, at every turn. Mm -hmm. OK, so it, it's like hide and go seek, you know, nine, nine, ten. Ready or not, here, <laughs> here I, I come. come. <laughs> That's the future. Ready or not, here I come. <laughs> OK, so I don't know how long the count is. I just hope that I've got a good hiding spot. <laughs> But um, you should not go into strategic war gaming. Yeah. <laughs> no. All right. All right. I threw a 20. My secret mage has disaster. Yes. I attack with full force of ice sprinkles. I don't know. Um, you know what? I think leaders love soldiers. Mm -hmm. The longer I'm in, the more I realize that in my heart. You just you just love them. 
and you want them to be well taken care of. Um, you knew what it was like back when you were at that level and you want, um, you're caught between the tension of what we have to do and what we want to do. And, you know, what we have to do is always more than what we feel like we can do, but we're always up to the challenge, always up to try and meeting mission and to make it happen. And, and, be, and soldiers and leaders love just making it happen, however they make it happen. It may be with 90 mile an hour tape and, you know, some and some Copenhagen, but we're going to make it happen. <laughs> um, and so what I think is trying to be communicated is um, you're needed. You're valued. And maybe it doesn't get communicated well. But you notice they're not saying, y'all just go do whatever, you know, because it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Okay? Whether you're here or you're not, we're going to make mission happen. Mm -hmm. All right? We're, they're going to do the, the mission. They're going to study. They're going to make the grade. So the fact that they're coming in and saying, hey, you're, you're needed, um, and this would be useful, mm -hmm. is to say, we can't do this without you. It would be more difficult to try and do it without you. And whether it gets communicated eloquently or just in, hey, you know what? I'm reading this, you know, I'm going line by line, you know, reading the script. Either way, the big takeaway is can't happen without you. When it all comes down to it, this is just simply about us making the business of the house happen and making life better for our kids and this is the life we have. And uh, when we talk about family readiness, perhaps it's readiness for this mission, but there also may be the aspect of what else are we making our kids ready for in the future that, that we can't even see right now, that the adversity they're going, that they are currently growing through is going to prepare them for in a way that we won't know. We may want, we may want to make this easy for them. We may want everything to be Pollyanna simple and not watch their tears. Let me tell you the amazing thing it develops in you. It develops a tenacity and a stick to and a grit and a, dare I say, resilience that you can't learn in school. You can't be taught by anything else, by anyone else other than difficulty and adversity. And so perhaps the school of hard knocks, which is the best school to go through, perhaps that's training our children up for something that we can't even foresee right now. So, and yeah. let's And let's be honest. That's why we love this community. Because there is no other community on the planet that we've come across that that is just as amazing. Yeah. And that loves deeply and serves deeply and suffers as well as we suffer. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. a reason why up at the, the top of our stairs, we've got quotes for the boys from Vince Lombardi. It ain't about whether you get knocked down. It's about whether you get back up. Mm -hmm. You know, General Patton, I don't measure a man by how high he climbs, but how high he bounces when he falls. We're all going to have disappointments. We're all going to have setbacks. We're all going to have stuff that we have to struggle through. What are you going to do with that? Because whatever you do with that, will give meaning to that difficult place in life. If you want that difficulty that you've been through to have meaning, you got to do something about that. But if you just want to be kind of a victim on the other side and just go, well, this just happened to me and I have no control and da 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 well, then it isn't useful. Mm -hmm. Make it useful. I mean, make it count. Mm -hmm. Don't go through that and just kind of suffer in, in silence and in solitude. Punch back. Mm -hmm. Get up off the mat and punch back. Stay raw, stay real, stay ready. Where did that come from? My brain. Just now? Just now. Just, Just missed it. Just now. I always drink I always drink coffee when I watch Mr. Radar. <laughs> you don't know, remember from Spaceballs? Oh yeah. Yeah. When did it happen? Just now. What was now? Then. When is then? Just, Just now. <laughs> what is now? Just, Just missed, missed it. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us. Um, thank you, Hun, for joining me. And um, you are so amazing at casting vision. And I'm so thankful that you do because I struggle with that sometimes. And you have a way of saying it in a way that, that breathes life back into me. Yeah. What? I breathe life into the life giver? 
<laughs> Apparently. <What? laughs> and for those that are listening, this is, this is what keeps me on course. This is what, where I get my strategy from is, you know, I struggle too. And oh. I get, we get that vision again oh. and we remind ourselves of, okay, we, yeah. you know, we might have low points, but it's time to get back going again. It's about having that vision again and serving you guys. So thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. Y'all. We love you. Thanks for listening to the Life Giver Podcast. If you're enjoying these conversations as being free of advertising or sponsorship, please help me by spreading the word to other military and first responder families that might benefit from the show. If you'd like to find out more about me or Life Giver, you can find more information at www.coryweathers.com or life-giver.org.